In this week's episode, we're going to be looking at all things digital forensics and incident response role. I'm interviewing Brandon Poole, a very senior digital forensics and incident response expert on what the job is, what are the pros and cons, and how you can get started in the field. Coming up. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Continuing on the, you know, all things entry level series within the cybersecurity world. Uh, this week we're talking to Brandon Poole about the DFIR, Digital Forensics and Incident Response Role. Now, Brandon works at Ceteria, which is local to Charleston cybersecurity company. And if you remember on the pen testing episode of, you know, the all things entry level, uh, we interviewed Paul Imey, who also is a member of Ceteria. So, you know, thanks a lot to the local Ceteria people. So Brandon is provided an amazing interview and he provides so many great tangible uh, real life examples and tools and tricks and softwares and books that you could get uh, to get into the field. He even gives some suggestions on how to interview for the field as an entry level position. Now, really quick before we get into the interview, if you're new here, this is Simply Cyber, a YouTube channel designed to help you take your cyber career further faster. And if you're a regular subscriber, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and hit subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave a comment, thumbs up, all the YouTube stuff. I love engaging with you guys. Now, digital forensics is an interesting um, part of the cybersecurity field that's very much blue team. After an incident has happened, the incident responders kind of like the SOC analyst role. Um, they deal with triaging and containing what the problem is. The digital forensics side of it actually goes back and looks at, you know, the logs, looks at um, forensics, disks, dead disks, um, does all sorts of investigative uh, work, think FBI type stuff, to really analyze and understand how the attack was perpetrated, what was the, you know, scope and, and dimension of the attack, and what artifacts were left behind so we can identify and attribute the attack to an individual or an individual group. Now, I don't want to ruin any more. I'll let Brandon talk because he was uh, just such an interesting person with a wealth of experience. So let's go on and get in the interview. Hope you enjoy it. Brandon, what, what do you, um, I guess, can you tell me a little bit about what digital forensics incident response really is? Yeah, so I guess the best way to put it is to give you an example. So someone out there gets like hit with an intrusion. Let's say they get ransomware. You know, a lot of times, especially in small organizations, they have no idea what to do. They're panicking like, oh, all my stuff, all my stuff. It's just completely gone. I can't access it. So, you know, they panic. And what will happen is if they have cyber insurance, they'll call up their cyber insurer or maybe they have a buddy who knows someone and they'll eventually come to an incident response digital forensic firm. And uh, what we do is we try to come in on a person's worst day when they're fearful that their business might absolutely go under you know, hold their hand, walk them through, give them the confidence, figure out what, what what happened, what went on, pretty much how the intrusion actually happened, uh, put uh, controls in place to contain it. Uh, once that those controls are in place to contain it, try to help them uh, remediate it and get their bas business back up and running as quickly as possible with uh, as few hiccups as possible, which uh, oftentimes tends to be like the difficult thing. So I would say like digital forensics and response really is kind of the cybersecurity or IT version of the ER doctor. You're coming in when, you know, the business is bleeding and you're having to like do a quick triage, plug the holes and uh, pretty much pull them out. Yeah, that that's interesting. Um, you know, when, you, when I think of digital forensics, you know, I think obviously like a deep technical skill set. I never really stopped to think that you probably have to deal with some soft skills because if you're dealing with a person on their worst day, um, that's different than what, you know, normal, you know, coffee talk, right? I mean, they're panicky or emotional or flipping out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say soft skills actually probably in a lot of cases are more important than the hard skills. It is easy to find people with the hard skills to go out and actually do the job. Like there's plenty of people who are super technical. Like you can treat uh, you know train someone how to go out and like read and cash you can train someone how to build that forensic story but you know if they come in and you know they're just completely like off-putting to the customer that customer is going to have a bad experience uh you know a lot of times when you come in these incident response like a perfect example uh the first uh incident response i did with Sateria 
you know, I'd done them before. I came in and uh, I get there and the uh, three top IT people are like, you know what? It's all my fault. I'm going to quit. Gonna quit. Put in my notice. And, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the CIO is like flipping out. And so it's like emotions are high. And what you really got to do is like you can't sugarcoat the truth. Um, yeah, there's probably someone to blame. Someone messed up somewhere, but that's not the intent of that. Uh, pretty much like defer investigation. The intent is to pretty much triage what's happening, stop the bleeding, recover you, and then we can talk about, you know, just like a doctor, we can talk about all those things that led to this accident. Maybe you were overweight and you should cut back on your sugar, your diabetic, or something like that. We can talk about that later. The thing is, the key is not to pass blame and also to kind of calm people down, to ground them kind of like, you know, it's not as bad as what you think. Like, you know, all these other things could happen. We could have called it early. It could have, you know, you've got backups. So, yeah, I would say soft skills actually pay, plays, like, a very important role. Now, I would also say kind of, like, depending on where you work, uh, some places break up kind of, like, instant response into its own thing and digital forensics into its own thing. So uh, maybe at FireEye is a perfect example. Like, they'll have, like, boots on the ground people that come in. Uh, you know, they do the data collection, initial triage. And they'll contain it, kind of. And then what happens is they have back-end, like, digital forensics people. They'll do, like, the heavy, deep forensics. Uh, you know, the initial guys on the ground just kind of triaging and then putting, you know, Band-Aids on things. Um, and then what happens is so you get your digital forensic folks in the background that's actually, you know, doing all the deep, detailed report writing and then feeding that information back for, you know, future improvements. But then they'll bring in like a whole nother thing, which is like incident response consultants. And it's their job to take you out of containment through remediation all the way to like recovery. So it also depends kind of on the business. Um, hmm. You know, I would say that a lot of like your small mid, mid size shops, kind of like our size, and even some of your bigger ones, uh, a lot of people wear kind of like both those hats, like digital forensics mm -hmm. and incident response. You might have like some really deep, like, dead this guys, you know, former FBI and, you know, they don't really do a whole, need a whole lot of that soft skill because they're back office guys. But um, yeah, I would say soft skills probably is like the most important, one of the most important skills of the job. Interesting. So what would you, you know, what would you say, you know, the pros and cons of, you know, this particular niche job within the field would be? Yeah, so I would say uh, I'd start with a con, and I'd say one of the uh, cons of the job, especially if you have, like, a family, is uh, getting that phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, telling you that you need to be, like, on an airplane to fly halfway across the country in, like, three or four hours. So you're, like, throwing stuff together. If you had, like, a vacation, you're going to have to cancel your vacation. You know, uh, you, you really have to be a lot flexible. Uh, kind of like a running joke in the field is that uh, no one has an incident until, like, 5 p.m. on a Friday. So uh, that right. would that would definitely be probably like the biggest con of the job in my opinion. Now that being said, um, one of the biggest pros is like the thrill of it all. Now, after a while, things like ransomware, you know, it's pretty pro pro prolific and, uh, you see it quite a bit out there, but a lot of like the TTPs are the same, but there's always these interesting like variations there, you know, uh, every customer is different. They have different security controls in place. And so you'll see that threat actor have to like, just slightly vary or they'll do like some really funky things sometimes. And you've got to try to figure out, well, why did they make this change? Why did they do this funky thing? Was like a security control in the way? Did they mess something up? Um, and then other times you just get really interesting calls. Another perfect example. I ended up on uh, one customer site and they got hit with like TrickBot, Emotet and Ryuk. And the Ryuk mm -hmm. was called very early on. And, uh, for you know, other reasons, failed to actually execute and encrypt anything. Luckily, but TrickBot and uh, Inotet was still like rampant in the environment. And it was like, all right, well, I've got all these like C two callbacks. Let's block them in the firewall. And they're like, well, we don't have a firewall. So what do you mean you don't have a firewall? And they're like, well, too hard to put firewall rules in. So we just took it out. <laughs> it's yeah, like wow, problem okay. solved. Yeah, it's like okay, well, wow. So let's figure out another way to block this like C two communication and stuff. So there was a lot yeah, of we stuff couldn't like yeah, that, yeah and, I was just thinking like like well we couldn't afford a firewall engineer, so we just figured we'd save money by not getting a firewall. Problem solved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like the next thing it's like, okay, well, you know, we got host based firewalls built into Windows. I'll use the Windows firewall. And the problem is they had like three different sites, but the sites weren't like connected via like a VPN or MPLS line. So mm -hmm. like there were like 
whole sections of computers that also were infected because, you know, someone like forwarded the attachment, the initial maldoc over to this other site. They got infected too. Oh. It's like they're not even connected to the Active Directory. So I can't even use like group policy in Windows Firewall. So it's like, all right, so this is really interesting. Like, how am I going to make this work? So, yeah, really and truly, like, because no customer's site or security controls are uniform, you run into all these different things. Like, you know, there's a lot of people out there. It's like, oh, you just do this in the firewall, you know, block this hash. Well, how are you going to block a hash if, you know, they don't have an EDR tool? And you could say, well, AppLock is built into Windows. Well, what if it's Linux? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, I mean, this is obviously deeply technical and, and can be quite challenging, uh, but if you're seasoned, it, it's a little bit easier. So, you know, how would someone who's like kind of early in their career, but interested in digital forensics and incident response kind of go about, you know, I, how, what, I guess, what would you recommend someone younger or a junior in their career on what to do if they, if they want to get into it? Uh, so as we said earlier, like the key kind of is like soft skills, like soft skills are really important because, you can have all the technical skills, and if you've never done like digital forensics before, it's really hard to go from not doing it before and getting that entry level job. So those soft skills help you like sell yourself in the interview. It helps you kind of like put that on the resume. Now, as far as hard skills, digital forensic incident response, I'm gonna say probably is one of the easiest jobs to get into if you know how to spin it right, going back to the soft skills. If you're a network administrator, you know, let's talk about network forensics. You know, being able to get a packet capture, use Wireshark, being able to understand how to read that. And you can even apply those skills to like your, you know, actual job as a network engineer. You know, maybe you won't, maybe there's a separate team doing like firewall stuff and IDS security, but can you take a packet capture and can you look at that wire speed and determine whether or not like a lag or an issue in the application is the application itself or some physical piece of hardware looking at that wire speed in Wireshark? Or, you know, maybe you can actually volunteer to help, like, you know, do some IDS stuff, some firewall stuff, build up some of that knowledge. If you're a systems guy, you know, Windows servers, Linux, Linux servers, they break all the time. Being able to get in and read those logs, I, I, system administration is a weird thing. It's almost like a lot of sysadmins just don't like to read logs for some reason. And that was a skill I picked up very early on and really helped me kind of in my career, both as a sysadmin in the SOC and even now as a digital forensic incident response person, like looking in the logs and understanding like what types of logs there are, what's logged in those logs, how you can go and turn on additional logging to get additional artifacts and stuff like that. Understanding that gives you kind of those hard skills that you can use uh, for some of that dead disk forensic, and even some of that live forensics. You know, if you are a programmer, you know, most people think, you know, programming, how is programming related? But there's actually, like, very narrow disciplines on, like, database forensics, understanding, like, what artifacts are, like, left behind whenever you query, like, databases. Now, is that going to be very common stuff? No, probably not. But if you're a programmer and, you know, you can pick up that kind of artifacts, there are big, like, Fortune 50 companies that, you know, they've got, like, secrets stored in all these databases, you know, bunches of customer data. Insider threats are very much, like, a big deal. And they're yeah. very interested in like some of these artifacts that are in these like database servers. So, you know, database forensics, or, you know, if you're a developer, even picking up some things like, you know, uh, a lot of things in Android is all Java based, like being able to understand like the fundamentals of that Android like operating system or iOS gets you in kind of like the mobile forensic space. Uh, really and truly like that, that's the beautiful thing about digital forensics uh, is you can go pick up a book. That's pretty much what I did. Like um, Harlan Carvey, big like windows forensics guy tons of books out there probably like one of his latest ones uh, investigating windows really kind of like lays out he's like the registry windows guru um mm -hmm. you can pick up that kind of stuff a lot of the tools are open source so all topsy and sleuth get you can start messing around like you can grab some you know set up your vm little malware sandbox uh, go up and you know go to like malware traffic analysis pull down your thing blow it up in your vm Power, you know, Paul, suspend that VM. You know, if you want to get into memory forensics, grab that NVMe. Or, you know, just shut down the machine and grab that VMDK. That VMDK can be loaded into autopsy as a, like a dead disk uh, for, uh, image and actually start like playing around with it. See what kind of artifacts you can find. 
let sleuth kit go through and like pull out things like jump lists and cash prefetch if you don't know what it is i mean it's easy enough to go and like read these in books or even google it and figure out what these artifacts are and what information are contained there mm -hmm. yeah that was i mean that's like a ton of dude that's a ton I, I was thinking you might suggest a couple pieces of technology to bone up on but i mean those are all excellent excellent uh recommendations and yeah i feel like you really um called out something interesting that you know digital forensics even though it's a niche of kind of blue team sec ops it, it even further explodes out where you can do database forensics mobile forensics you know um dead disk live you know like it's interesting just how niche you can really go um into that particular uh subfield yeah and even in what it's just another thing like that's just like the forensics piece we're talking about the incident response piece like yeah that soft skill is definitely really important there but also understanding like security architecture. So, you know, if you've got something, you know, this network layer based, like, okay, what in my security architecture can block or prevent this type of stuff? You know, so being able to understand, do you have a firewall? Is it a layer seven firewall or layer three firewall? So being able mm -hmm. to kind of talk about like the security architecture intelligently kind of coach the customer, like how to use that security architecture, because there's tons of people with a layer seven firewall that just doesn't understand you know, how to use some of these layer seven rules and whatnot. Or, you know, there's tons of people with like an EDR tool that just doesn't understand how to like optimize and kind of use all that functionality of the EDR tool. So it sounds like uh, kind of a couple of tools, couple of books, and then just time in the saddle is really uh, what you need to kind of. Uh, yeah, I would even like, I'll even throw out another one out there. So uh, DFIR.training is written by like Brett Shavers, who's another big guy out there. He's written a bunch of books on like X Ways, which is like a cheaper, but definitely like more featured funk, uh, feature uh, version of Autopsy and Sleuth Kit. Uh, but he has DFIR training uh, or DFIR.training domain. And, you know, he lists out things like SANS and some other paid trainings, but he also indexes a lot of like. Uh, Twitter posts, a lot of YouTube videos on how to use like Sleuth Kit and Autopsy or, uh, you know, all kind of interesting things like blogs you can read. So that's like a good place to even go and just kind of like a, I guess like an RSS feed or like a meta place to pick up a lot of this stuff. If, if people want to engage with you uh, to get more information or learn more about DFIR and stuff like that, you know, how could people get with you? Yeah, so I would say uh, LinkedIn probably is the best way to get in touch with me just because I remember that. So uh, just uh -huh. Brandon Poole on LinkedIn, uh, look for the one that works for Steria. Feel free to uh, kind of like message me there. If you're not like in my network, I guess, first or second connection, probably the next best way is Twitter. I do have open DMs there. And I believe you can find me at, at Panopsi. So that's at P-A-N-O-P-P-C-Y on Twitter. All right. Perfect. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for uh, talking with me and sharing uh, just a wealth of information on digital forensics and incident response. Appreciate it. No problem. Pleasure was all mine. Again, thank you so much to Brandon for giving us his time and really, really providing that rich, rich uh, interview. Now, I'll just let you know that after we stopped filming for this, the recording kept going and Brandon and I talked for another 20 minutes and we actually got started talking about um, detection engineering and really a, a kind of, a, I don't want to call it a niche field, but it's like a new kind of area within the incident response space around kind of... Um, chaining together a bunch of different alert types to weed out false positives and i'm going to bundle that up and actually make it a whole other video because we were kind of just wrapping off the cuff and it was you know i thought it was very very interesting um material so anyways thanks again to brandon thanks again to Sateria. until next week stay secure